Okay, seeing that everybody is assembled, good to have you all here. Thank you. Uh, it is Wednesday, June 10th, 2020. And um, this is a meeting of the Sustainable Development Committee of Bloomington City Council. Um, shall we, my name is Sue Scambaluri, I'm the chair. Mr. Sigler, do we need to call the roll here or no? Uh, as far as I know with committees, I don't think we have. Okay. I didn't before. think so. so. I didn't think so. Um, we have one item on our agenda for this evening and that's ordinance 2011. This was, uh, we saw this in first reading at council special session earlier tonight. Uh, and this is our opportunity to have a more in-depth presentation on that. Um, shall we read the ordinance again for people who might be viewing these two meetings separately? I don't see any need. I mean, uh, okay. we know we know what's on the agenda. We should hear a presentation. Okay. So again, this is just quickly. This is Ordinance 2011, an ordinance recommending that portions of the Bloomington Municipal Code be temporarily suspended due to the ongoing public health emergency. And Mr. Crowley, I believe, was going to begin the conversation on this. I am. Yes. There you um, okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Thank you. So I'm Alex Crowley. I'm the Director of Economic Sustainable Development with the City of Bloomington. Um, let me start by uh, first thanking you for your consideration of this, of these uh, two requests that are embedded in the same uh, sort of process, I guess. Um, and then also give you a little context. So, you know, as you know, and I mentioned this in the previous meeting, um, the Economic Stabilization and Recovery Working Group uh, and a number of partners throughout the community have been uh, focused on three phases of uh, reaction, if you will, to the pandemic. So the first phase being the you know, rapid response phase. The second phase uh, is the reopening one, and that's the one that's relevant to this particular action. And then there's the long-term revitalization phase. So the way that, that uh, the, the reopening has occurred, um, led primarily actually by the chamber uh, and supported by other members of the working group and other members of the community um, has been to essentially first prepare via education and access to resources the businesses and organizations in the community that uh, really we all count on uh, for some um, basic needs and also for, for, uh, for some of the cultural aspects of the community. Um, prepare them for reopening. And so the, the chamber undertook about two and a half weeks of intensive pre-opening education, which involved a number of Zoom calls, uh, which were recorded and available, access to PPE equipment, signage, uh, a, whole, a whole variety of activities. City was involved in it, a number of other entities were involved in it too prepare for the reopening process. And the reopening began, and, it's, and frankly, it's been happening slowly and deliberately, which is good because I, you know, I don't think we wanna be reckless about this. Um, and, and as the city reopens, um, we are looking at a couple of different ways that we can potentially uh, eliminate some of the friction of the reopening process. Um, what's captured in the ordinance are two elements of that. The first is uh, having to do with signage, and I'll take you through some high level of, of what's embedded in the, in the ordinance so you, so you understand that. And the other is a request uh, from the Kirkwood uh, Association of, of, you know, commercial association basically, of uh, reopening portions of Kirkwood um, by closing the street to allow for some um, capacity that they would otherwise have to have inside uh, to extend outside, thereby potentially um, increasing the interest among people, uh, potential customers, to take advantage of their um, of their services. And that's both restaurants and and also stores, to the extent that ultimately uh, both would be in play. So uh, the genesis, of, in addition to that, I should say that one, uh, we're about to launch a program called um, B Town Summer Challenge, um, and B Town Summer Challenge is essentially a Kind of a gamified uh, way to get the community reinvolved in um, organizations and businesses in town. It's essentially a, a you know a checklist of activity that you can do. Uh, every week you do ten things 
which involve spending money or not. It doesn't require spending money. So there are activities you can do that don't involve that for those, those people that don't prefer not to do that or can't. And, um, and then you submit your little game card every week and you're eligible for a small prize. And at the end, there's a big prize. So it's just a way to uh, engage the, re-engage the community, uh, try to get them to think about ways in which they can, they can engage in the downtown uh, business um, economy that we have. Um, and so this, this particular ordinance is part of a much broader picture, all of which we've sort of stacked to be able to help businesses get through this pretty terrible time. I think we'll all recognize uh, economically for them. And, um, and so, um, you know, I think it's an important part of the action. Um, the, the feedback that has led to this uh, really has motiv motivated us to set this up the way we have, and that's uh, twofold. So we, we've received feedback from uh, businesses themselves, from the chamber, uh, other organizations that said, hey, if you could do stuff to make the signage um, limitations a little bit more relaxed, that will allow for, um, among other things, a signage that's required to communicate some of the health protocols for being going on. And I'll take you through some of the, the details there. And then from the Kirkwood perspective, um, really it was, this was initiated from the Kirkwood group uh, asking to try this out. And we really appreciate that because certainly it's not something we want to do from the top down, from the city imposing it on, on commercial interests. We want the commercial interests to be advocating for this because then, um, then we know that they are on board and, and that's what they've done. Mm -hmm. So what I, I thought I would do, if it's okay, is, is share a couple of slides. They summarize what is captured in the memo uh, that you have. So it's not new information, which is why I didn't send it along ahead of time. I'm certainly, uh, Stephen, a, able to make it available if people want to see it after the fact. But it essentially is extracting some of the key data from the memo. I'll take you through that. I should also tell you that um, you know th there has been a lot of intentionality in what's going on here. Uh, a lot of due diligence as we've gone through what we wanted to do and not, and frankly, not do. Um, and and as you may know, this has uh, uh, this is making its way across a number of different uh, public boards. So the plan commission has seen it, the board of public works has seen it, and then also a number of departments internal to the administration. So of course, uh, you know, economic sustainable development's been involved, planning and transportation have been involved. Public works have been involved, and, and 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 other departments, so that we know that we're we're covering the bases. We're trying to do this uh, diligently, and we're not creating problems when we're trying to solve them. So let me share my screen, if I may, uh, for just a couple of slides. Again, this is pretty short. Uh, you see my screen, okay? Yes, thank you. So again, this is a, a two part, two part. Uh, the, the easing signage reg regulations and then permitting uh, for, for the signage and then also the Kirkwood closure. So on the easing of sign signage regulation uh, and permitting, uh, the goals are to help businesses communicate their safety protocols to potential customers and visitors during the reopening, um, to remove barriers in the sign process during economically challenging times, and to allow for a smooth transition back to normal sign requirements when the adjustments expire. So what we're asking for uh, through September 30th, 2020, at this point, is to suspend fees for temporary sign permits, which cost $75 per temporary sign right now, to suspend fees for permanent sign permits, which costs, currently close, uh, cost $125, and um, simplify and streamline the application and permitting process for temporary sign permits um, and relax certain restrictions on temporary signs and sandwich boards in the mixed use downtown district. So uh, you'll see mostly the emphasis is on temporary signs because what we don't wanna do is create a problem where people have exceeded regulations on a permanent sign and then have to pull that back uh, when the period that we've, we've asked for relief ends. So we are relieving uh, uh, costs on the, on the permanent side. We think that that would be helpful to drive commerce, but not the actual, um, not the actual uh, limitations on permanent signs. And then from a Kirkwood closure perspective, uh, just summar the summary is, uh, first of all, what, we wanted, what we're asking is a temporary closure of portions of Kirkwood Avenue to pedestrian traffic 
and to be able to expand seating in the public right of way. So literally what this would mean is uh, restaurants and stores would have the sidewalk in front of their, uh, uh, you know, their, their brick and mortar shops and the parking spots in front of them. They would self-regulate to know who's, who had to have as much space. Um, and we would essentially close the streets and we would create the, uh, the, the sidewalks within the, tr the now former traffic lanes of, that, of those closed streets. So you would maintain ADA accessible, accessibility, but you would have an extension of the inside space through the sidewalk and onto the actual parking spaces of the, um, of the closed blocks. The initial tests that we're planning for is the weekend of uh, June 19th through the 21st, starting at five o'clock on Friday the 19th and ending uh, you know, early evening on the 21st, which is Sunday. Again, all of this is by request by the Kirkwood uh, Avenue Association. And then um, we do wanna uh, spend a lot of time paying attention to what happens. We, as I mentioned, we don't wanna create uh, any kind of problems that were unintended, including health problems. So we will be uh, paying co close attention to this initial trial. And if we uh, all agree, and the, and the Kirkwood group is on board with this, if we all agree that it, it actually is a good thing and we wanna continue it, we'd like the opportunity uh, to get to allow them to continue it through September 30th. Um, and then some minor uh, activities that'll be done on the administration side to support it. Number one, to, that we would accept a single application for the seating and merchandising encroachment on behalf of all of the participating restaurants and this should also add um, stores to the extent mm -hmm. they're participating. The nice thing about the recent renovation of Kirkwood is that city staff can easily close the, the streets by putting bollards off. So we would put them between Grant and Dunn and Dunn and Indiana. For the, for the initial selected weekend, we could expand that as needed. Um, that we would put no parking signage on the affected blocks, uh, communicate with the food trucks to say you have to sort of not be in that area because obviously that would create some contention with the seating area. And then uh, place signage at both ends to redirect uh, walking traffic through uh, into the traffic lanes. So that is, um, that's a summary and um, I'm happy to, uh, ask, uh, so, so number one, I'm here to answer any questions. And I know that uh, Mr. Rooker from our legal department um, is available as well uh, to help answer any technical questions that might arise out of this. And thank you very much. Mr. Rooker, did you wanna make additional comments right now or just be available to answer questions? You know, I think anything I would say at this point would be repetitive of what okay. Alex said. So I think I'll just be available to answer questions committee members may have. Got it, thank you. Committee members, questions, comments, observations? Council member Flaherty. Sure, uh, thank you uh, city staff for being with us tonight and thank you for the presentation, Mr. Crowley. Um, and I think just checking out a few details here in my understanding, um, I'm sure y'all are thinking about these things, but uh, I believe um, at a work session previously, it was mentioned that if uh, seating is extended fully into the sidewalks um, and, and parts of Kirkwood are closed that that would then the street itself Kirkwood would become the pedestrian um, uh, Corridor and then second also thinking about signage. I know there were some parts in the um, ordinance that mention um, You know maximum uh, or minimum width uh, between signs and that sort of thing. So basically just thinking about uh, ADA accessibility and walkability and wanting to make sure that uh, all of that's been fully, um, you know, thought of both in the context of signs and seating. So I'll jump in and, and answer this one. Yes, we have, uh, we've discussed those issues thoroughly. There was some concern initially that by closing off the sidewalk, we may create an ADA problem, but after uh, doing some research on it in the legal department, it was clear that we could remain ADA compliant by um, using the vehicular traffic space of the roadway uh, as a pedestrian thoroughfare. Um, and, you know, the, the good news is on that front, uh, I guess I'm going to call it good news, but maybe in this context, it's good news. Bloomington is, is certainly not the first city to do this. Um, this is something we've seen uh, done in the post-COVID-19 world or the it's not post-COVID-19 world, but as part of economic recovery initiatives in lots of parts of this state and the country. So um, this is a, a typical model and, and it's been vetted as, as compliant with the ADA. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, I have a 
Council Member Volan? I'll defer. Okay. Um, just a couple of quick questions on my part. Um, for the public's benefit, we received a supplement to the packet tonight that showed a markup of this or of this um, of this document, and it included the word merchandising, and that was done specifically so our retail stores could participate. Is that correct? That's a hundred percent right, Council Member Escambolari. That's that's exactly right. Great, thank you. And um, the Kirkwood Community Association (KCA) uh, one of the clauses in here allow the Kirkwood Community Association to submit a single application for additional seating and merchandising encroachment on behalf of all participating restaurants. Are we still tracking who's participating and who's not? Do how how does that work? I, Will, will there be any surprises of or competition over certain areas of, of sidewalk or anything like that? Well, let me answer that in a couple of different ways. So one of the reasons we've limited this to the initial couple of blocks is because they have limited it to it. Um, so the way that they've managed the process has been to um, assign a block captain to each of the blocks on Kirkwood for start. Um, that block captain was responsible for uh, getting 100% uh, approval from the, the block's uh, commercial interests to close the, the street off. Um, and so they were able to get that, uh, that approval from the initial uh, subset of, of total uh, businesses on Kirkwood um, for the blocks in question. Uh, that, that I think is a good way to do it because then you don't run into the problem of some people saying, hey, we didn't want this to happen. And then suddenly we're, you know, everybody's stuck in the middle of competing interests. So I think that that's, uh, that's helpful. The other thing um, that's helpful is, you know, we're basically saying you need to hear the basic parameters that we're gonna do. You know, we're gonna allow street closure, we're gonna allow, um, you know, infringement on the, on the right of way, but you, you kind of need to police yourselves. So we don't wanna be in the business of saying, you know, business A gets this particular footprint, business B gets that foot footprint. Uh, we'd like that to be managed by the uh, KCA and then by the merchants themselves. So, so how that works out is going to be up to them. We don't want to dictate that as part of this. Uh, we do obviously want it to be friendly, and, and I think it's going to be. Um, but part of the way to manage this carefully moving forward is to do a small trial. That's what we're ask, uh, asking for first, see how it goes, see what kind of problems come up, and then you know work through those problems. I'm, it's not going to be perfect. Um, and so beyond, beyond the macro risk of inadvertently creating a health hazard, there are, there are, there are likely going to be micro challenges along the way that we're going to have to figure out uh, as if and, and, and when this were to continue throughout the, the summer and the fall. So um, that's, that's the approach we're taking. And I, I think it's a pretty strong uh, organization to be able to manage that uh, for themselves. And we'll certainly be here to help with, with the the basic, um, you know, the blocking and tackling that we need to do to get the safety of the street closures um, and, and just the, 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 the logistics of this uh, complete. Great. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, and plus, we have scores of other cities that we can learn from who have already done this. So, um, questions, Council Member Volan? Yeah, I was interested by the date that you chose. Uh, to extend it to if it's successful, September 30th. Um, why not just go through farmer's market season through the end of October? Uh, if it's successful, why, why end it that prematurely? That's also leaf changing season. It's a, you know, there still would be a possibility of outside seating. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah, honestly a little bit arbitrary. I think our, our, our primary objective was not to stop it before too early into the student return. So we felt like there would be a need to educate these, the whatever portion of the student body comes back for into back into, into commercial interests in, in town. So we, we didn't want to cut it off too early. Whether or not September 30th is the end date, I think at this point remains to be seen if it's wildly successful and uh, you know everybody agrees it's a good thing and we should keep going with it. Uh, we're not also arbitrarily throwing the gate down and saying that's it. Uh, one of the benefits, as I mentioned, of the Kirkwood um, renovation is that it allows for a very easy street closure process without, in, without involving a ton of resources to get that done. 
So it is pretty easy, at least on Kirkwood, to to push that uh, out if we wanted to do it. It was we'd come back to you for that. But but I think for us, we're just trying to extend it far enough into the return of students to allow for some reintegration, and then kind of see where it see where it goes from there. Uh, a lot of unknowns in the future, as as you might imagine. Okay, but so as long as uh, there's no uh, like uh, um, uh, like it's, uh, I don't know how to articulate it. As long as you can extend it without trouble, like if you don't need our permission to extend it, that's fine with me. Uh, but I feel like, uh, you know, like if you're gonna go ahead and extend it, if it works, uh, you know, farmer's market is very similar in that it's outdoors until, at least in this climate until beginning of November. So thank you. And I would just jump in on that last point, council member Volan. Um, in the event that we did want to extend it, I, I think we would likely come back to this body in some capacity um, to, to let you know that at the very least. So, Okay. Um, you, as long as you don't need our permission to do it, I just as soon give you the permission now and you can decide whether or not to, to cut it off early. But we appreciate that trust. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Other questions from Council, council Member Flaherty? Yes. Um, in section three, uh, I have a couple of questions related to this um, of the ordinance. Um, the, I guess first, uh, when, when section three discusses, um, uh, let me see, get the exact language, these formalities, um, you know, be waived and, and describe certain conditions, is that refer referring to all of them? So both um, Title 12 as well as uh, Title 20, all in, in one category would be the first, like, they, section three applies to both of those types of changes, to both section one and section two, I guess is my first question. So uh, I'll jump in on this one. Se so it depends on, section three is a big paragraph, so it depends on which part of section three you're talking about. Ah. The, por the portion of section three that sets uh, September 30th as the cutoff date for these changes applies to both Title 20 and Title 12, but there are subsequent sections of, uh, subsequent sentences in section three that um, clarify the process for the different processes for extending the Title 12 relaxation and the Title 20 relaxation, if that makes sense. Got it. I see that now. So is that, and that was actually my other question was, um, there's kind of two scenarios anticipated, both of which are if the um, uh, disaster emergency ends prior to September 30, 2020, uh, is the first one then in, for Title 12 specifically, and that's the one that council can take by resolution, and the second um, scenario outlined is for plan commission to have the authority to take action and that's for title 20 is that correct you've got it exactly right okay I'm all clear thanks um, we can certainly continue with questions if there are others but um, I would also invite I believe there are a few people here to offer public comment um, and I just want to mention you may want to um, start indicating that now uh, so we can track that just raise hand uh, you can use the raise hand function in zoom down at the bottom of your screen, click on participant. Um, and Mr. Lucas will keep us posted on, on where we need to go. So uh, other questions from the committee? Okay, let's go to the public then. Um, Mr. Lucas, who do we have? I believe I saw uh, Talisha Kopik uh, indicate that she would like to comment first. So I have unmuted her and she should be ready to go. Ms. Kopik, thank you for coming. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, and if you could please introduce yourself and your role. All righty, okay. And, and I think that the host has to start the video. If not, that's okay. Um, my name is Talisha Kopik with Downtown Bloomington, Inc. And um, you know, as you know, the COVID pandemic has devastated our downtown ecosystem. It includes restaurants and retailers, attractions, galleries, personal care, salons, and spas. Um, these types of businesses were the hardest hit by the pandemic because they had to close their business almost three months ago at this point with no operational revenue. Um, so fortunately, some of these businesses were able to receive the PPP federal assistance. Some benefited from the food and beverage rapid response, which was amazing that the city was able to pull that together as quickly as he did. Um, but then some decided to not take out an additional loan and use savings. Um, so now these funds are starting to run out um, and the 
pandemic uh, continues, the next three months are crucial for their business viability. Uh, much of downtown is starting to open, but very slowly and very gradually. Um, and some venues and attractions still aren't allowed to open until July. Um, we already know that reopening is not going to be the same as it was when these businesses closed three months ago. Uh, everybody's doing things a little bit differently. Um, they're acting quickly to change their modes of operation. Um, they've started some delivery options with the retailers bringing them to your front door, selling online options. They've got staggered shifts. They're managing their employees, uh, getting them back to work and getting them trained. Um, they've got increased costs, um, you know, getting their supply lines going again is a challenge. Um, some are starting to look at selling their businesses, um, succession planning, um, you know, there and while all at the same time maneuvering all of this and needing to do it in a safe manner, uh, consistent with the health department guidelines, um, with the physical distancing, the wearing masks, you know, they're having to coach their staff, uh, you know, to keep those masks on. Um, be very respectful of their customers coming in. They're having to coach customers, provide masks uh, to remind them that, you know, Bloomington's very uh, serious about uh, our mask policy and being safe. And, and, and um, so that's an important message that they're helping share uh, to people who come into our community. Uh, and our local folks. Um, the restaurants are still at 50% uh, capacity. Um, people are hesitant to come inside. Uh, that's what's so exciting about uh, using some of this outdoor street space. Um, back to your question about, you know, how do you determine who's going to take over the street or not and how much space? They do still have to keep their occupancy to 50% um, in their seating, but because people aren't coming inside, this is going to help them even meet that. Um, retail is still at reduced occupancy. Um, and for most of our stores, that means only two people uh, in the shop at a time. Um, so they've got, you know, different challenges with you know, some of them even knowing who's open and who's closed. I think some of these signage um, uh, waivers and, and changes are going to be able to help them just even announce that they're open and we want people to come in. Um, there's, um, you know, they've got all kinds of challenges with, you know, negotiating some of their rent terms with, uh, you know, decisions when leases come due and if they've got the energy to get back in there and rebuild the business, knowing that it's going to take a while. Um, you know, some are um, uh, looking into um, all kinds of different options. And so they're using best practices around the country, sharing different information with each other. Um, but kind of the one exciting thing about all of this, it's brought a lot of different groups of people together. The Kirkwood group, like they're getting together now and meeting the brick and mortar group continues to meet. Um, it's opened up a lot of uh, communication the galleries, you know, they've always had a strong committee, but they're starting to do vi virtual gallery walks. Um, even the venues have uh, combined together with other venue owners to talk about uh, what they can do once they open with best practices. So, um, but in all of this, most importantly, um, reopening really has to do with customer sentiments about safety and feeling comfortable getting back in public and going to restaurants and events and shops. Um, it's a kind of our responsibility as businesses and, and public officials to remind people those masks really do help. You do need to wash your hands. You need to stay six foot away. Um, but you know, try to get back to some sense of, of business while doing that. Um, you know, it also has to do with shoppers' worries about unemployment and uh, if they personally need to conserve resources uh, until they feel confident to spend. So it's a very deep um, situation that we're all in right now. And I think the ordinances before you uh, now, uh, with the fee waivers and the reductions and the relaxed sign orange and the additional space outdoors, they're important policies that say that you care and that you want to help where you can uh, get downtown back open. And every bit helps. Some things are going to be big, some are going to be little. But, um, you know, to that individual person who just, I just want to put a 
sign out <laughs> or, you know, they want to just do one thing that's really, really important for them in marketing their message. And um, so I'd like to thank the mayor and the city sustainable committee and the city council for once again, stepping forward to support downtown and the small businesses and all of our attractions. Um, we support the ordinance before you and um, just thank you so much for being such uh, great community leaders. Thank you, Ms. Coppin. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Bickett, who do we have next? I believe next uh, the B Squared Beacon uh, is ready to make a comment. Okay, I believe that would be Mr. Afton. Yes, Council Member Scandalary, thank you. This is Dave Askins with the Beast Bud Beacon. And uh, first off, I don't have an expectation that any of the questions that I uh, have will necessarily get answered. I do understand it's not meant to be a back and forth, but in any case, I, I figured that this is a, a good opportunity to ask the questions and it might be an efficient way uh, to get answers. So there's a note in the packet about this ordinance under a subheading, it's called unusual legislation. And a note under that subheading says, uh, while the ordinance may look like an amendment to Title 20, it isn't and does not follow the procedures for an amendment. So that makes me wonder, well, um, and I guess you can call this question one, um, in what way are the procedures for passing this ordinance departing from the procedures for passing a code amendment? And I would add, for my part, from where I'm sitting, it doesn't look at all like a change to Title 20. And in fact, it seems like it almost doesn't do anything at all. Um, and the only reason it seems like it does something is that it has the word ordinance at the top. Um, and, I, and the reason I say that, uh, if you look at the whereas clauses, there's one that uh, says, whereas the city possesses discretion to not enforce portions of its municipal code, during these extraordinary times and would like to make clear to all affected persons and businesses which local regulations will not be enforced. And then there's another uh, whereas clause that says, whereas for a temporary period of time, as described below, the city will be relaxing and or waiving certain formalities related to sign regulations. Um, so if you condense you know, the giant pile of words um, that is, I mean, I don't mean that to be disparaging of the crafting of the ordinance. I mean, any ordinance is gonna be a giant pile of words. Any article I read, write is a giant pile of words. But if you condense that bunch of words, what you've got is something like, whereas the city will be doing X, Y, Z, the council ordains that the city requests that the city will be doing X, Y, Z. So it's a little puzzling as to why the council actually needs to, to perform this legislative act. Um, so just with that as a background, two additional questions. Uh, question two, is the discretion to not enforce code during these extraordinary times tied to a specific way uh, or tied in a specific way to one of the governor's orders? And if so, which one? And uh, the final question, question three, from a legal point of view, why is this in the form of an ordinance as opposed to a resolution? because a resolution seems like it'd have the advantage that it could have been done in a single step at the council's meeting tonight, instead of adding a committee hearing now, and then it'll go to a vote at a meeting next week. So is this important legally that it be an ordinance, or is it basically that it extends the process and it helps with the communications effort? Is that really the point? Or is it in fact a legal issue? That's sort of what I'm concerned with. Thanks a bunch. Thank you, Mr. Afton. Mr. Lucas, who do we have next? I believe next up we have uh, Mike McAfee, who should be unmuted and ready to comment. Okay. And let me also point out that Mr. McAfee has added to chat um, the btownsummerchallenge.com website as a preview. Uh, Mr. McAfee, please go ahead. Yeah, thank, thanks for having me. My name is Mike McAfee. I'm with, I'm with Visit Bloomington. I, I did throw that in the chat there when when Alex introduced that uh, summer challenge promotion, if, if you want to check that out, uh, that's a sneak preview that uh, that will go live in a few days. Um, I did I did want to start off by um, thanking the the committee for um, this uh, action, and I also wanted to compliment Alex for his leadership on the recovery 
um, group. He's he's been doing a great job, and and I really appreciate his leadership. I was um, looking at the Food and Beverage Commission info, and I saw that the May so May business, and so it would be on the June report. The June report for the food and beverage tax brought in is about one hundred seventy thousand dollars in. May business for 2020. Last year, May of 2019, it was $343,000. So 1% of, you know, 170,000 is 1% of 17 million, 343,000 is 1% of 34 million. So basically, food and beverage revenue has been cut in half. In the county, the chart for this year shows that the city has has been keeping about 90% of that tax. So they've been generating about 90% of that revenue in the city owned or the city located collection points for that food and beverage tax. So that's about 15 to $16 million in food and beverage revenue for city food and beverage collection points when last year was about 30 million. So that just shows you what the coronavirus has done. It's really cut that business in half and we're seeing that and what the restaurants are reporting. So um, tons of lost jobs. I've, I've heard, uh, um, I, you know, slowly they're recovering, um, starting to recover. I mean, we saw it as soon as the governor's um, plan, the, the, the calendar that he put forth or the plan that he put forth and, and then what Monroe County and, and the city of Bloomington followed a little bit later. But we saw as soon as we, every time we reached a new step, and more things were allowed to open, we could just see it and the numbers ticking up at hotels, at restaurants and those types of things. So, so it is, it is, things are slowly but surely coming back. I just want to make those points, but, but um, no doubt um, downtown and, and, and I'm certainly coming at it from a hospitality business standpoint, restaurants and retail make up a big part of our incredible downtown, incredibly impactful on um, not only our economy, which I just talked about, but our culture identifies who, what Bloomington is all about and, and one of the most attractive things and the thing that um, citizens and visitors love most about our community, obviously. But this is important um, um, for all the reasons that Alex and, and Talisha already pointed out. I loved what Alex was saying about a trial. This is, I mean, all of, you know, this is all about safety, right? This is all about our, um, we need to be able to provide a safe product down there, both to community members and, and they need to feel comfortable about it. They need to be, feel comfortable taking their families down there. They need to feel comfortable telling their friends and relatives to come, all that type of stuff. So safety is a huge part of it. So I love the fact that we can use this as a trial going forward to build up that confidence both locally and as we begin to get that messaging out to Indianapolis and other places when Visit Wilmington does that in a few weeks months when the time is right to start attracting that. So, so I think um, having this extra seating, obviously, um, um, uh, you know, to know it's safety part of that is a no brainer. The further these, I was reading um, some statistics about the safest activities that um, are um, the hardest to catch the coronavirus based on a scale of one to 10. Uh, outside seating was a four and inside seating was a six based on that scale of one to 10. So I think that's obvious, but it was interesting to actually read it. It was a study of um, some Michigan healthcare experts were talking about that. Um, you know, more space gives you more, more room to advertise or, or promote your safety protocols, the things you're doing above and beyond um, what you were doing pre-coronavirus. That is what I read was the number one reason people are going to places is because that business or organization has made changes to make their business or their, their environment for their customers more safe and they're telling them about it. So having the signage available to do that um, is key and, and, and um, for this and, and another reason to approve this action. Obviously, it's going to lead to more business and, and having more room and more tables. Um, and, and it's just going to be able to tell people that we that they're open. Um, having the, the, They'll also maybe be able to put menu items out there that um, can improve the quality of the experience. Um, that's going to be important going forward more than ever. Um, when we are having visitors coming into the community, hopefully later this fall, um, 
that's going to be on a limited capacity. It won't be the same as it was in the past, and it's going to be more competitive than ever. As I've said before, I think Bloomington is positioned well to, to do as well as anybody just because we, we, we are a small town. People are looking for small town places to get away to, less population densities. They, they want to avoid crowds where it's safer, and we have the amenities of a lot of, a lot of bigger communities. So, mm -hmm. so we sit well for that as long as we open up safely and can offer a safe product. And, and these two measures will go a long way towards that. Thank you. Thank I'll you. answer any questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, and if I'm incorrectly, it looks like we have one more, Ms. Morgan. Is that correct, Mr. Lucas? Yes. Okay, Ms. Morgan, welcome. Please go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Mary Morgan with the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I echo what Alex and Talisha and Mike have already said. Um, the chamber's the chamber staff has been doing a lot of work over the past couple months on behalf of the broader community and the broader business community. Um, but one of the things we did specifically for our members was um, in April we we called uh, all of our roughly 900 members to check in and to see how they were doing and to see what some of their needs were. And um, the things that you're acting on tonight are direct. Uh, reflection of some of the feedback we got when we were talking to people. And, and when we've been talking to them um, since then, and as they consider reopening. So these are um, important uh, actions to take. I mean, these are neither, nothing you're doing tonight is a silver bullet, um, but each little thing, uh, as Talisha said, helps. Um, when I was talking to some of these business owners, uh, frankly, some of their uh, stories were heartbreaking. Um, these are people in our community, many of them who've been here for decades and, and watching um, what's happening, not to just their businesses, but to the people that they work with and that they support and to the families of those, those people. So everything that you can do um, tonight and in the future uh, will be very much appreciated. Um, you know, it, it might seem like a small thing, but really you're sending a message that the city is an ally uh, to these people in our community and um, for the businesses, but but really to the, the people that they employ and who earn their livelihoods at these local businesses. So thanks very much. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Mr. Lucas, I'm not seeing any additional commenters, are you? No. Okay, thank you. Um, if we'll come back to committee in just a second. Are there any additional comments? Uh, from the city, from Mr. Crowley, or oh, Mr. Crowley, go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I just wanted to, first of all, thank uh, for everybody for the public comment. Um, number one, the chamber, as I mentioned earlier, has been instrumental in pulling together that kind of pre-opening, opening phase. Uh, it's, there was a huge lift and they just stood up uh, a tremendous amount of information sharing. So it was really it's super impressive to see that happen. and. And actually very necessary because I think that that gave a, a sense of calm and predictability to some of the businesses that might have otherwise been a little bit frazzled by that potential uh, exercise. DBI, uh, Talisha's uh, team and, and group, I mean, they have Denton Business at Bloomington Inc. Uh, the reason why there are these groups that exist is because of the work that she's done to, to organize that in advance. Uh, you know, you do that and it's great that they exist in normal times. It's particularly great that they exist uh, in, in moments like these because it allows for coalescing of, of groups and sharing of information. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's pretty amazing what DBI does all the time, but particularly now. Um, and then Visit Bloomington, um, you know, uh, Mike, uh, is, is being a little bit shy about this, but Visit Bloomington is, is, is the group that uh, has basically created B-Town Summer Challenge. And, and he and Aaron White and members of his team have really th they created this basically from scratch. And the advantage of it is that not only will it be helpful this summer, but actually it's being uh, created with an eye towards uh, future years. So, so the summertime in Bloomington has always been a slow period. And, um, you know, it, uh, the reason it's not branded COVID specifically, for example, is because we don't want it to be a one and done. We want this to be something that can be useful well into the future as, uh, you know, as the doldrums of the summer 
um, inevitably will hit in the future as students come and go. So, I mean, all of those organizations and, you know, the B Square Beacon, I should mention, thank you for those questions. I will, of course, defer to Mike on those because <laughs> I don't know the answers, but, uh, you know, thank you for the, for the, you know, the scrutiny and the uh, coverage, uh, but, but, but certainly just wanted to highlight uh, the roles that these organizations are playing in, in keeping us all, um, um, you know, strong, as strong as possible during these times. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crowley. Mr. Rucker, did you have anything to add? Sure, I would be uh, happy to do my best to address uh, Mr. Askin's questions. I think I've got them, but if I've missed something, if somebody would please remind me, uh, let me know. I think the first question was, uh, what would the, the normal process be for an amendment to Title 20? Uh, and the short answer to that is that if the council wanted to pass an amendment to Title 20, they would take it up to a, at, at a meeting. They would then have to refer it to the plan commission for consideration before they could do the amendment. The plan commission would have 60 days after it was referred to the plan commission to make a recommendation on the proposed amendment. And then after they made a recommendation, it would come back to the city council, which would have 90 days then to consider whether or not to uh, follow the plan commission's amendment excuse me, follow the plan commission's recommendation or not with regard to the amendment. So um, Title 20 changes are, are different than changes to other portions of the city code. It's a, a little bit more intense um, than, than you would normally see. Um, with regard to the second question, I, I think the question was essentially, uh, why, why is this an ordinance? Um, and, you know, I think this is one of those things where we are living through an extraordinary moment and imposing these sorts of um, extraordinary measures is something that none of us have done before. Um, I've been doing this, you know, for 11 years. I know Mr. Sherman's been doing this for a lot longer than me. And these are unique moments when we're, when we're passing ordinances in ways that are a little bit more creative than we normally would. So um, this ordinance does in fact um, request that, the executive branch of city government exercise its discretion um, to not enforce portions of Title 20, which is a really unique measure. And uh, I think that's something that we would feel very uncomfortable doing without agreement from uh, the legislative branch as well, that this is an extraordinary moment where that sort of um, unique approach would be appropriate for a temporary period of time. So this is not the sort of ordinance I would anticipate seeing again. Um, but in this particular unique moment, uh, this is this is the mechanism we have for that. So I hope that addresses those questions. If there were others that um, that I didn't quite fully answer, I'd be happy to do my best if I've missed them. Thank you, Mr. Rucker. Let's come back to committee. Questions, comments, discussion, Council Member Roland. Um, I don't have any questions. I was just going to comment. Please I do. Can wait. Um, what, there was a question posed in the chat room. I don't know if we oh. want to deal with that first. Um, question from Edmonds on Facebook. Is the health department involved in outdoor table cleaning process or helping set up outdoor hand sanitizing stations for street cleaning? Um, I, so, yeah, I defer to Alex on that one. I'm, I don't know if the health department has been involved at all. The health department has been uh, consulted by the KCA. So from the, I think what the, the question has to do with the Kirkwood open, uh, closing, right? Um, and they have been involved in some of those discussions and uh, weighed in and provided some feedback. Now, you know, the governmental units, whether it's the county or the city are not specifically involved in um, providing hardware, tables, cleaning supplies, that sort of thing. I mean, all of that will be the responsibility of the uh, commercial interests uh, that are participating. Uh, what we're going to do from a city perspective is, is you know, create these closures and, and prepare them and, and get the logistics right. And from a health department perspective, certainly um, the guidance that I think it was uh, Talisha perhaps uh, mentioned that, that uh, for example, capacity, you cannot, you cannot increase your capacity uh, by having increased outdoor space. What your capacity is, is what it is. And this was guidance that came from them that said, you know, pay attention that you cannot somehow expand your footprint and then call it incremental capacity. So, but to her point, um, you know, what it does allow for is a sense of comfort from people visiting a restaurant or whatever that allows them to um, 
perhaps do it in a way that they might not if they were uh, required to go indoors. So they have been involved in, as, you know, in consultation in the process, but, um, but not in, in a, a direct kind of hardware way, if you will. Thank you, Mr. Crowley. Mr. Flaherty, did I see your hand earlier? Please go ahead. Could you unmute, please? Yep, thank you. Yeah, I, I, um, I may, need, may need to do some more thinking uh, to, articulate, to articulate things uh, fully clearly. Um, but I, I guess um, looking at the whereas clauses, um, it's, it's, not, it's not completely clear to me um, under what authority certain elements of this are being done, whether it's all just um, could be done at any time per home rule uh, authority generally, or if any of this is tied directly to the emergency order, or if the, or if the references to state emergency uh, um, orders are just sort of for, for context and, and um, you know, legislative history and clarity, but um, in particular, the second to last whereas clause um, that says the city possesses discretion to not enforce portions of the municipal code during these extraordinary times. Is that meant to say that we only have that discretion during an emergency or is it more um, generic than that? And then also the term the city there, is that meant to mean um, the executive and legislative collectively as a political subdivision? Uh, working in concert via ordinance, or is it meant to mean the city executive specifically? And um, I, I, I'm certain that's for Mr. Rooker. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I hate to get into uh, a discussion about um, the relative powers of the branches of government. If, uh, if an email exchange is better, that's that's fine. Uh -huh. I mean, I, this yeah, is, but, yeah. <laughs> I can at least uh, attempt to uh, approach it real quick in this meeting to, to give some guidance. You know, I think it may be helpful to consider the various package of measures individually. So the, maybe the easiest one is sort of the, the temporary and, and permanent uh, sign fees, for example. There's already a provision in the, in the city code and in the, in the UDO that says where a measure is being actively promoted by this, the city, um, the, the plan commission can go ahead and waive permit fees. And the plan commission chose to do that at its meeting on Monday already. So, so that's done. Uh, with regard to sort of closing the right of way, there probably would have been a couple of ways to, to proceed with that. Um, we've opted to do it by uh, formally requesting a, a suspension um, of, or extension, I should say, relaxation of some of the Title 12 requirements from the city council, but probably uh, this could have been done, it would have been maybe a little clunkier, but it could have done been done with a number of special event permits and applications to the Board of Public Works. So there's also a process for that. That created some additional complications, but there would have been a way to do that already just, um, just under the, the, the current um, uh, scheme that we have. And that would have, that would have probably worked um, for that portion of it. With regard to the relaxation of temporary signs so that businesses have the flexibility to put up signs about the pandemic, directing customers in terms of how to act, and then also um, signs that will be required to, to be um, located in different places as a result of uh, the expansion of seating and merchandising, um, th that just made sense in the context of the other changes. And so that's where we're really requesting that the council be in lockstep with the executive branch and saying, let's exercise a little bit of prosecutorial discretion in this case and, and do what makes sense as opposed to, um, you know, being a draconian with, with the, the strict requirements of title 20, if that makes sense. So. Sure. Thank you. And, and so if I understood correctly, then from that, um, no, none of those measures are, are directly tied to an emergency order being in effect or anything like that is these are all things we could exercise at any time under, uh, the authority we have. I would make that argument. There might be some people who wouldn't agree with me, but I certainly would say that. So, okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. I certainly appreciated Mr. Rooker's explanation as to how we would normally go through a change in a title, going through the plan commission, and how many days that involves. We are in unprecedented times. We're dealing with um, a, a very serious um, COVID nineteen epidemic. It's having a very serious impact on our downtown, on all, all sm small businesses everywhere. And to the extent that we can use our ability to streamline the process and still keep it transparent, and we were having this meeting tonight, we are an advisory to the rest of the council, 
um, and to put this out there for the public to understand what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it, I think makes perfect sense in a time that none of us have experienced before. I have grave concerns about our, our downtown businesses. They are struggling and many are gonna survive, many perhaps are not. And anything the city of Bloomington can do within its authority and within proper transparency procedures to make things easier, make things less onerous, I think is a step in a very positive direction. I, I do wanna have one more comment about other people who are hurting in, in our um, arts and entertainment district and that's the performing artists. They're gonna be the last to recover from this terrible, terrible pandemic. Uh, in getting people in the seats of our theaters. The Buskirk Chumley and of course the Waldron is now in, in flux for, a, for another reason. And starting here with the small businesses and the restaurants with this trial balloon, if you will, to allow them to expand, to allow them to safely allow more people to enter into the commercial district, I think is a, again, uh, uh, it's it, there are risks involved clearly and we want to respect all the uh, advice we're getting from the health professionals about how how wise this is to start allowing people to gather. But if we can do it outdoors during the summer months and not go through all the, 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 the red tape that we normally have to uh, so that we can do this and get some wheels turning for getting some energy flowing in that downtown, I think it's critically important that we do that uh, as a stepping stone for a very long and slow recovery that we have ahead of ourselves. So I am in complete uh, support of this, regardless of what mechanisms we've had to employ, I think they're common sense and uh, I'm happy to support it and uh, uh, pass a, a recommendation on to our colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Sandberg. Council Member Flaherty. Um, yeah, I actually had one more question that came to mind, if that's okay. Um, I think it's probably from Mr. Crowley. Uh, I, had a, I actually had a constituent ask the other day, um, if, if, you know, just about this general concept, I'm not sure if she had already heard about what the Kirkwood Community Association was planning or not, uh, but she had asked specifically about uh, the business, the Owlery, which, which she likes to frequent, you know, on the north side of the square, um, although the north side of the square is actually closed right now for other uh, construction purposes, I think. But um, it made me, like, I don't know if the Owlery is part of the Kirkwood Community Association um, or if their association extends any businesses off of Kirkwood. So I guess my question is, um, has the city um, done any outreach or had any inquiries from other businesses in our downtown that might not be part of this particular proposal from the uh, KCA uh, to have similar, similarly available uh, to them, you know, uh, the ability to, to have outdoor seating in an ex expanded way that might help them kickstart their business earlier than they otherwise would. Um, and if so, what have the, what's come of those discussions so far? And if not, um, is that something uh, you all would be open to doing? So those have come up and, and legitimately, right? So we, we don't mean to limit the benefit to Kirkwood. One of the advantages of starting on Kirkwood, which is really, this is the start, is that uh, it's easy to do. The, the bollards, the new infrastructure, I mean, it, it makes it a lot easier to do. Uh, Fourth Street has come up um, mm -hmm. as a potential place, uh, you know, obviously, um, other parts of town have the same, would, would, would benefit from, from this kind of activity. Uh, it's gonna be a balancing act between safety and, um, and benefit. Um, you know, it's a little harder to close college <laughs> than it is to close Kirkwood. Um, and, you know, so we just have to be a little bit careful and deliberate about how we go about doing it. Public Works, uh, Adam Wason and Public Works Department has expressed a willingness to look at uh, other areas. And, and so I think, I think the short answer is absolutely open to it. Um, may not be possible everywhere. Uh, certainly takes more effort in other places, effort from a city staff perspective. Um, and, but that would not keep us from doing it. Uh, we just have to be careful about um, what it means, where it's happening, uh, you know, traffic patterns, and, and we wanna make sure we try to extend this benefit to as many businesses as possible. The objective is really to try to help as many businesses as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments, Council Member Volan. Yeah, I wanna echo Councilmember Sandberg's sentiments. I think that uh, we are in an extraordinary time. This is no ordinary emergency. 
and they require extraordinary measures. Uh, I feel satisfied with the answer that Mr. Rooker gave about uh, why this is an ordinance rather than a, a resolution. Um, and uh, it, in a way, it's sort of like uh, we need an ordinance to create new city code. We should use an ordinance to suspend it. So um, I'm satisfied with that. Um, I do think that September 30th is an arbitrary date, and it's arbitrarily early. Um, you know, as I said, October is uh, usually the most popular tourist season in Bloomington, uh, uh, or at least uh, in the, the region, you know, the, when the leaves change colors. And the weather is nice enough that uh, restaurants can and do serve many days outside if they have outdoor seating. Um, and because IU has announced that uh, they will only have students present in town, uh, or at least classes uh, in person until Thanksgiving, um, I am contemplating a, an amendment to simply change the word September to November. In other words, that the permission to do this would end November 30th. Most restaurants are probably not going to, uh, to want to do that, but this gives them the option uh, I don't see any point in stopping on September 30th with this. It's an unusual uh, time, and uh, I don't feel like uh, we, I don't need uh, economic and sustainable development to come back to us for a resolution to get permission to, to continue after September 30th. I think that they should just have permission through the possible warm days right up through you know, the lighting of the Christmas tree on the courthouse square. Thank you. Council Member Sandberg. And with my rosy recommendation here, I do want to put one word of caution out there and that we still need to watch the trends with the COVID. If we start to see spikes and flu season approaching and there have been projections that there could be a second wave, even in spite of um, you know, people's good intentions to socially distance and wear masks and everything else. If we start to see a rise in COVID cases as a result of what we're doing, I would err on the side of maybe being a little more cautious, keeping it to September for now and until we get a little bit more um, experience under our belts with what this might do to the actual health crisis in our community. Uh, does that does that make sense? I mean, we could always revisit that if we want to extend, but I, I'm I'm comfortable with keeping it to September. In that this is a temporary measure, as we try to see, um, will some of these um, uh, lightening up of some you know signage and some lesser fees and more extension into the street um, will help the businesses? But we also have a health crisis that we've got to monitor very carefully. Thank you, Councilmember Holland. Well, uh, just to respond to that, I think that, um, you know, one of the things we've established about the COVID crisis is that, um, you know, it, it, the outbreaks happen most indoors with HVAC, with people sitting in close quarters. And what we're proposing is the opposite of that, is people sitting outdoors uh, with the wind blowing and sitting socially distanced. So, um, you know, I, I certainly share Councilor Sandberg's concern about uh, the health pandemic. I'm certainly, I'm somebody who is uh, at, at, at advanced risk myself. Um, but uh, I think that this is one measure that, I mean, flu season, uh, I don't think it ramps up, uh, you know, before Thanksgiving. Maybe I'm wrong about that. All I said in my first comment was I'm contemplating uh, an amendment. Um, I think it's modest. And again, I think that the administration has done a pretty good job so far of, uh, you know, reacting to the crisis, uh, being careful about it. And all we're doing is saying they have permission if they see fit to extend till then. Uh, but I don't see the need for them to come back to us for uh, renewal of it uh, through November 30th. So I'm still thinking about it. It's not that big a deal. I want to get feedback from people whether they, you know, they think it's a big deal. But I would extend it, uh, you know, at least through October. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Flaherty. Uh, sure, I don't have much to add. Uh, I support this. Uh, I think it's a great idea to uh, 
um, allow allow our businesses to to operate in a safer way and, and in a way that I think a lot of folks will be more comfortable with getting um, getting back to restaurants downtown and retailers, uh, merchandisers as well. Um, so I think it's great, great way to enhance our public space and use some of the new features we've installed on Kirkwood. I, I hope um, we can look seriously at, at Fourth Street and then, um, when I mentioned the Owlery, that'd be like between Walnut and College on, on the north side of the square. In fact, my hometown, Springfield, Illinois, where I was born, um, they have a historic um, downtown square similar. And the north and south, so the, the east-west sides of the square are sort of arterials, just like ours. And the north-south sides are, are uh, permanently closed as pedestrian malls on, on the north and south side of the square in, uh, in Springfield, Illinois, which is kind of nice uh, for those businesses. Anyway, uh, I support it. Thank you, staff, uh, for your work on it. Other comments? Okay, I'll just chime in at the end too. Um, great, let's go. <laughs> um, I think this. I think this is a delightful idea. I think um, as we recover from COVID nineteen, we all want to get back to a lot of our favorite places and anything we could do to encourage people to do that safely um, and to begin that revitalization process, I think is great. And I appreciate um, in particular, just clearly you put a lot of thought into this. CAF has looked at this, planning has looked at this, Board of Public Works reviewed it last night. Um, so I appreciate just the due diligence you've put into this. Um, and I'm looking forward to our downtown being back and I am totally uh, looking forward to the summer challenge. Uh, so I look forward to seeing that. So with that, I'll entertain a motion for do pass. Move do pass. Second. Thank you, council members Roland and Sandberg. Um, shall we, do you want to call the roll or do you, shall we just go around? Council, I'll call on council member Roland. Yes. Council member Sandberg. Yes. Council member Flaherty. Yes. And I will vote yes as well. So, um, any other comments, questions for the good of the order? Um, Thank you. Just, just a reminder that the committee uh, report will need to be uh, produced and signed uh, before next week's uh, regular session. So I can work with the committee chair to get that drafted, but uh, committee members should keep their eye open for that report uh, being circulated. Thanks, good reminder. Any other comments or questions? From the group. May I make a final comment? Please, Mr. Crowley. So I, I, first of all, I just uh, wanted to thank the committee for your review of this, uh, which is a little convoluted, but it's uh, really, we really appreciate you looking at it and asking the questions you did. And, and thanking the committee and, and council. I mean, it, it is pretty remarkable how uh, council's uh, supported a lot of the activities that uh, not only the ESNR working group, but the social services working group has undertaken. And we really appreciate the, the, the support um, to, to try to do you know, the somewhat limited stuff that we can do as a governmental entity to help. Uh, but, it, but it has certainly not gone unnoticed in the community how supportive council has been. Um, and we really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Crowley. Um, move to I don't adjourn. think we have any other business before this group. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So, second. Thank you, all of you. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? And with that, thank you for your time tonight. Enjoy the rest of your evening. We'll see you in the next checkerboard uh, that we're all in. So good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, all.